First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Abakhon Sultan Nazarov, uh, uh, IWPR Regional Director for Central Asia. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight at the second jointly uh, organized online discussion by IWPR Central Asia and Foreign Policy Center. Uh, first of all, let me express uh, my gratitude to you, uh, Adam, uh, the Foreign Policy Center team and our distinguished uh, researchers uh, for your continuous uh, work on studying Central Asian region and its processes. Uh, we're really very honored and proud to be holding this event uh, tonight and look forward to having more events with Foreign Policy Center in the future. Uh, conducting discussions about the challenges faced by our Central Asian uh, region will allow us uh, to bring together international experts and experienced analysts and uh, to hear their opinions on the existing problems and hear possible solutions. Uh, such a practice allows us for cross fertilization and generation of unique new ideas. Uh, today we'll talk about one of the process in Central Asia and how uh, as citizen activists uh, can save our cities by protecting housing and cultural uh, heritage. So hence, we are here today to listen, to discuss, and ask uh, questions from our distinguished uh, panel of uh, speakers. So I'm looking forward, uh, I look forward to a fruitful discussion. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, Adam, back to you. Thank you very much, Abahan. And we've been delighted um, with the partnership with Kabar over the last year um, online, because uh, as words, we all still are, um, but uh, hopefully for not, not exclusively for that much longer. Um, I'm Adam Hug, I'm director of the Foreign Policy Centre. And as Abahan says, um, we have over the last year been conducting um, a range of different research looking at the situation in Central Asia, um, looking at Uzbekistan uh, last year and this year, um, we are currently in the middle of a three publication series looking at um, human rights and the political situation in Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and Kazakhstan. Um, and uh, through, the, through our recent research, both uh, Dilmiria and Zenia, who are with us today, have contributed on this theme uh, to those pieces of research. Um, but we, as, as Abahan says, we're wanting to talk today about the city and the way in which the built environment is at the center of struggles for power and control in the cities of Central Asia, uh, the way in which um, the, the built environment is used as part of nation building projects by the region's leaders, um, how the process of development can be captured by economically and politically connected actors um, with issues around corruption and lack of transparency uh, and how residents have often yeah, been at the sharp end of some of these uh, these bigger economic forces in terms of uh, home demolition and uh, forced evictions um, but also how residents have been how citizens have been organizing online and in the real world to push back against those pressures and how those movements have interlinked with prep movements to help save the region's cultural heritage uh, again from those sometimes rapacious economic forces that are, are, are driving uh, change in the city and I'm delighted to be joined by five experts from uh, for, across four countries of the region uh, and we are going to um, I'll, I won't speak anymore. We'll, I think we'll get underway with the discussions and I'll introduce people as they um, come to speak. So I am delighted to be joined first uh, by Dilmira Matyakobova, who is a researcher, policy analyst and co-director of UZ Investigations, uh, as well as being a research fellow at the Foreign Policy Center. Uh, so Mira is going to give us a perspective from Uzbekistan. Um, take it away, Mira. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, um, a year ago, we talked with you on um, Uzbekistan uh, following our report, and I looked at the report you've done on Tajikistan, um, a great report, and congratulations. Um, so I'm going to um, talk about um, 
various aspects of um, urban development because um, this is a you know uh, a huge development and um, obviously has um, impact on society um, as cultural social economic um, impact so um normally uh, in kleptocracies like Uzbekistan um, it, it's natural I think to observe um, massive um, mega urban projects um, are being used as a tool for laundering money, laundering cash and, and uh, with an aim to enlarge uh, capital, enlarge um, basically wealth by certain groups, uh, political elite, um, economic elite that are emerging as political elite, but in the context of Uzbekistan. Um, so, but I'm going to talk um, more about the, this aspect of um, planning later on. I want to start share with you just the um, few slides, just to give the idea of what's going on in Tashkent and around Uzbekistan. <laughs> so, this is one of the projects that are ongoing in Tashkent now. Um, I don't know why it's called London, so probably I think Adam, you should you should tell this to Sadiq Khan, maybe he would would maybe object, would maybe laugh. Uh, but anyways, I called it Forging Fiction because um, there are many um, projects like these that are imitating European cities, like, you know, um, to be like called like. Gardens, Residence, Cambridge, Oxford, and Manhattan. I've seen recently the new one, Manhattan. So these are basically uh, um, uh, copies of the basically uh, well-known cities um, across the globe that are developed cities normally. Um, so why um, this is important? I mean, investigating, examining uh, urban change um because basically um it's affecting the cultural um fabric or in, in terms of architecture if you look at the um the soviet recent soviet past of uzbekistan i see this is losing largely its architectural architectural heritage for the sake of these kind of new um, um formats, <laughs> new uh, structures. So basically, it, this could be like reimagining the future. I don't know if you can call it the future. But anyways, um, I think it's a matter of taste, but I won't comment on that. But in terms of practicality, um, the cinema house, uh, or, which was built in the 80s in Soviet time, was much more practical. And um, it was designed specifically for making cinemas films, uh, but the um, very peculiar and specific um, interior. Well, basically, the building itself was an iconic, so that was demolished for the Tashkent City project in 2017. Um, so that's the cultural aspect. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the economic, socioeconomic aspect, um, because um, there's urban poor or urban lower income group, good uh, call. Um, there are being now um, evicted and moved to outskirts of the city. Uh, and this is one of the areas that basically uh, was demolished for the Tashkent city, the same project, uh, almost or uh, Mahala. Um, uh, well, basically, the the percentage of um, what we call so a, a lower income uh, group, um, the larger percentage, so about seventy percent of it, live in uh, villages, rural areas, or in small towns, um, which is not urban space. Um, whereas uh, the middle income class. Uh, live in urban areas only in 30%, and it's 30% of the class. Um, 
uh, whereas the or the poor uh, only 11 percent of the uh, uh, low income uh, group lives in um, urban spaces. Um, in, in a way, I think this is affecting these large uh, projects affecting uh, the, the urban poor um, even more because they're vulnerable in, in economic um, positions that once they move, they have to change the job, they have to change schools, they have to change basically um, social networks. So all of that, um, affect their life and sources of economic um, condition, basically. So in my, from my observations um, and research, I could tell that um, this, is, this, has a, this has harmful impact on, on the poor. Ah, also, urban development uh, has impact on medi medium-sized businesses like Ultramar. I called flying metro because on the um, left side you can see the metro, new metro, <laughs> elevated metro built uh, just recently, uh, a brand new. Um, its cladding was, you know, just flying in the in the weather in the other day. And on the right hand you see the factory, wheelchair factory, basically, which produces um, disability equipment of various kinds. Um, it has provided jobs over you know, 20 years uh, in Tashkent. So that is under demolition now in, for the sake of this metro. I mean, so you can see the contrast here, what is more useful. Um, so um, uh, here are other issues as well. I can talk more, but I don't think I have time. So in, in terms of um, businesses and investment. This is actually a foreign um, investor who um, established its um, enterprise a long time ago in Uzbekistan. Uh, um, but there is a decree by the president that there is no need to support investors, foreign investors in particular. But that is going um, just completely in contrast um, and contradiction um, to that. Um, legislation and many other legislations uh, and so Antramark is now fighting uh, for survival and, and going through courts and trying to um, save. Um, here I just want to show that your contrast uh, of Mahalas being a big I mean, demolished, um, eradicated in the old city um, on so on the Left side is the original um, view of the Mahala near um, Hastimam area. Hastimam is a complex um, mosque and center. Um, the museum now is being built uh, just right on, you know, in the middle of the Mahala. So those areas were uh, eradicated. Yeah, residential areas were eradicated with the traditional uh, settlement and traditional types of architecture. And this has been studied uh, by uh, a colleague, James Wilhelm, um, who's written an, another article for uh, this report, uh, at this report, has this address, if anyone is interested, in traditional architecture. And there's also uh, a threat to uh, different kinds of architecture. I mean, the, the ancient form, the Islamic, so I think this image doesn't need ex any explanation. Just just tells us tells us all <laughs> what's happening in Kiva, an ancient city. Um, and so I want to just comment on that. And the next one, I just wanted to talk about the ongoing, well, kind of ongoing uh, process, uh, the fight for space uh, between the state and the society. Um, so it has been going on since January. Um, with the uh, decision on um, erecting a monument celebrating 30 years anniversary of Uzbekistan by the president. So the mayor uh, chose this park. Uh, the park is called um, Blue Domes, basically. And uh, everyone was, so the, the, the citizens were uh, discontent, showing discontent and that they were not agreeing with it. So they, they had meeting with the mayor where they expressed their concerns and 
So it seems like um, at that time he didn't listen, but it seems like later on, as soon as he decided and that uh, they have chosen a different place, the, the president has shown a symbolic kind of act that he, he could have, he planted a tree in a, in a Tashkent region in Cabrai Park somewhere. I said, this is a, this is a symbol of uh, 30 years of matter. But anyways, uh, what it shows is that, that there, there is a battle for dialogue with, uh, with the government. The people are fighting to have that kind of conversation um, in order to save spaces, you know, for public. This is basically the one of the few parks in Tashkent still has. It's a civic space uh, where all kinds of activities um, you know, can be observed. Um, so that that's that. Um, well, I think if anyone interested in being in further um, on urban planning and the corruption in the country, um, you can check out our website, uzinvestigations.org. Um, Definitely. Here, I think we, put, we can put that in the chat, I think, uh, the link to oh, it. Be good now. Um, because there's a lot of, lot of good information on there. Thanks very much, Mira, for that um, that overview. And I think you've, you pointed at, you ended there on, on a, a point where issues around heritage and public space have mobilised a broader range of, pu of public opinion that would otherwise have been active uh, in, in, in anything that would be seen as more political. But it's, it's, it's the importance of these issues, whether it's home demolitions or destroying parks and trees, that actually bring in a far broader range of of, of concerned citizens and which you know creates opportunities for dialogue with with politicians if they're willing to do it um, but also risks if they're not willing to, to manage the process effectively um, thank thank you very much for that um, that initial remark so we'll come back to things in the question so can I please encourage people who want to ask questions of our speakers to put uh, your questions in the chat function uh, and then we'll get to it uh, once the our speakers have finished finish their initial remarks. Um, okay, I'm delighted to hand over now to Xenia Mironova, who is an uh, expert on uh, urbanisation and, and related issues in uh, Tajikistan, and Xenia has contributed a um, essay on this topic to our recent, uh, FPC's recent publication on Tajikistan, which I will also put in the chat for uh, you to have a look at at, uh, at a later today. Um, but I'll take it away, Xenia. Thank you, Arden. Thank you, colleagues, uh, for her having this opportunity to uh, discuss with you some of the findings. And uh, please excuse me in advance if I start coughing. So uh, in my research, I can see that uh, the internal development of Tajikistan and particularly Dushanbe, and uh, which actually influences uh, the perception of the country uh, by its uh, uh, former and uh, current residents. So I started uh, the residency development. Uh, um, I, I mean, I, during my research, I uh, started uh, a residency a registration system co called Propiska, then uh, redevelopment of Dushanbe in terms of uh, demolitions and forced evictions. I also considered uh, how uh, this residency registration system, which I mentioned before, actually uh, influences uh, and violates uh, the basic human rights. And uh, I considered uh, how, uh, uh, like, uh, 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 how uh, the tragic lead is uh, involved in uh, the uh, construction sector of uh, Tajikistan. So uh, please let me speak about uh, some of the issues raised in my research. And uh, the first one is uh, Propiska. So Propiska, it is uh, the holdover of uh, the Soviet Union, and it is used to, to control internal and external migration of the population. And uh, it, we can use it uh, to uh, meet uh, uh, the right to housing, the right to vote, the right to labor, the right to education, uh, health protection, and so on. And uh, uh, there are still uh, a lot of people who do not have uh, propiska or and or passports in Tajikistan, and among them are um, orphans, uh, the disadvantaged and underprivileged, and also those who used to be citizens of the neighboring countries like uh, Afghanistan or Uzbekistan. Uh, those people, uh, they because of their 
legal illiteracy, they were not able to get propiska and or passports during uh, the civil war after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And because of that, they just uh, uh, met their, um, I, I mean, they just uh, leave in Tajikistan without having any uh, registration, without having any official registration. So, um, uh, and um, these people, they are now uh, a subject to different kind of fines because of not having propiska or passports. And uh, they are subject to um, some uh, uh, administrative punishments. Um, and uh, they do not have any kind of social support because they do not have their propiska and uh, they're not able to get uh, pensions, uh, to get birth certificates or of course passports and they are not even open bank accounts and uh, they are not able to purchase SIM cards, for example, to, uh, to just to use with their mobile phones. And uh, but there is actually an option for them, which is um, kind of hidden by the government, because um, these people they could go to their uh, reception centers, which are called Priyomniki Raspredzilitsili in Russian, and these uh, reception centers are under the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Uh, but uh, government officials uh, are not. Um, they, they do not provide this information to the population and people are not aware about the opportunities they have. So this is the first issue which I considered dur during my research. The second one was uh, about uh, demolitions and uh, forced eviction, evictions happening in uh, Dushanbe. So uh, demolitions in Dushanbe are happening against uh, old solid two, three, and four decades, which are actually uh, located mainly in uh, the downtown of Dushanbe. And uh, um, others, like, I mean, um, the slum dwellings, which are located also, some of them are also located in the downtown of Dushanbe, and some of them are located in the suburbs. They are not, uh, they remain untouched by the government, let's say so. And uh, it raises a lot of questions why this thing is happening in Dushanbe. Uh, and uh, the thing which we can see now is just, it is that uh, the chaotic and field development is happening in Dushanbe. And uh, people, they do not have, um, any kind of open access to uh, the general plans by, uh, of Dushanbe and other cities, and uh, they are not aware about their future. And some of these people, they were actually forcibly evicted in uh, Dushanbe, and uh, some of them are still in the process of uh, forced eviction. And um, uh, so these people, uh, they are dealing with real estate developers who are actually um, responsible for uh, any kind of, um, um, how to say, for any kind of compensations uh, which uh, should be provided to the tenants of, uh, the, uh, of, uh, the, uh, of the demolished buildings. And, um, but real estate developers, they try not to pay this uh, lucrative uh, compensation. They try to uh, withhold um, uh, paying rents. And uh, additionally, they try to, um, uh, to embezzle funds to, uh, when they make these uh, constructions. And uh, they use the uh, constructions of very poor quality. But uh, there is a, uh, a 2020 Evaluation Act, according to which real estate developers, they are responsible for making material detail contracts and uh, on compensations with uh, forcibly evicted. And uh, the property, it should be appraised by the appraisers uh, of real estate developers or some, um, some other independent appraiser, uh, appraisals. 
Uh, and um, in this case, like those people who are, I mean, those forcibly evicted who are aware of this uh, Valuation Act or who are aware of um, the fact that they have uh, their right to proper housing, they just um, have to, um, uh, to find any kind of solution to uh, not to be fooled, let's say so, uh, by the real estate developers. So uh, what they do, they, uh, they appeal to media, they appeal to the government, uh, they appeal to court, to the president and uh, to uh, an, uh, a public organization, which is called um, Independent Center for Human Rights Protection. And uh, this uh, public organization is actually the one which meets all uh, requirements of uh, their forcibly evicted and provides um, them with uh, lawyers who could uh, assist uh, forcibly evicted in uh, solving their issues with the real estate developers. And um, so uh, this is uh, some of the facts which I uh, used during my uh, research. Another issue which I raised uh, there was uh, uh, the money-making schemes in the construction sector. Uh, so I would like to say that uh, the construction sector in Tajikistan is one of the sectors most vulnerable to corruption. And uh, particularly in Tajikistan, uh, the closure of the political system allows those in the system to overstep and make a good use of the office and power for their own ends. And uh, uh, those real estate developers uh, which are functioning, who are functioning in Tajikistan, they are very close to, uh, to the Tajik elite. And some of them, they are very close to the family of the president. And uh, for example, because of this uh, uh, closeness to uh, the elite, uh, some of the money-making schemes, um, uh, they are, um, Mm, available for them, let's say so. For example, there are cases when uh, uh, government officials, they register their um, construction organizations uh, with, um, uh, with their family members. I mean, uh, these uh, construction organizations, they, they uh, belong to uh, their family members. Uh, and um, so, um, this is the case of elite stroise, uh, elite uh, stroy service. Uh, for example, it belongs uh, to uh, the family of the head of the tax committee. And uh, in the case of elite stroy service, uh, there were um, like eight big uh, residential buildings, which were built uh, since uh, 2007. Uh, and um, I mean, it was the multi-stored buildings and um, maybe this uh, figure is not so big, but uh, uh, the thing is that um, the head of this uh, construction um, organization is just, um, he's just a very young person who is uh, the son of this uh, head of the tax committee. And uh, this issue raises a lot of questions. Uh, another issue raises. Um, uh, oh, we've got to, got to try and bring as many people in as possible. So if you just bring it to a close, that'd be great. Thank yeah. You. Uh, just, I would like to mention that uh, there were the other cases, like the case of uh, Bek Sabur, uh, who used uh, not only his family members as uh, those who could help him in earning money, but he also used uh, uh, the poor quality construction materials uh, when the, he constructed some of his uh, residential buildings. And now a lot of uh, people, they just have a lot of problems because of that, because they're not able to get their supportive documents uh, uh, on their housing. They uh, purchased from Bek Sabur. And uh, if I have time for uh, recommendations, I would like to mention some, Adam. Well, 
perhaps we can come to perhaps we can come to them in the Q and A at the end because I think okay. I'd like to ideally end on a positive note where we can make some recommendations. Uh, mm -hmm. But do do feel free to put the full recommendations in the chat if you if you want as well. I'm just conscious we've got five people on the panel, so yeah. um, okay. if if that's right, we can come to that at the end of the Q and A session. Uh, so delighted also to um, on, on to do some, to bring in uh, Tamina in the toy over. Um, Tamina. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Let me just share my screen quickly. Can you see? Can you see my slide? So hello everyone, my name is Tahmina. I'm a PhD candidate at Simon Fraser University uh, in Vancouver, Canada. Before I start my formal presentation, I would like to share uh, a little bit about myself because I think positionality plays a very important part in our research, especially when we're researching cities and identities. So I was born in a Russian speaking Tajik family in Dushanbe and lived in Dushanbe until my early twenties. And my family still lives there. My, grandpa my grandparents' house was located on the central Rudakia Avenue, or as my grandma would call it, Prospect Lenina. Both my school and university were located in the center of the city, and I grew up walking the streets of central Dushanbe. Currently, these streets are rapidly changing due, due to a large-scale urban transformation, and I decided to dedicate my doctoral study to this personal topic. So in my research, I critically explore discourses of nationhood, social justice, development, identity, and memory in Tajikistan by examining urban space and architecture as means of communicating and negotiating new ideologies, not just in Dushanbe, but in other emerging cities of Central Asia. My doctoral research explores both top-down process of the urban transformation of Dushanbe and bottom-up discourses and discussions of local city residents and activists around these changes. Um, but I have to note these um, um, these narratives are not mutually exclusive. The, these dimensions are not mutually exclusive, and they can and they do overlap. Um, I conducted interviews last year in Dushanbe, both with policymakers in Dushanbe and uh, local residents, as well as activists. Recently, with my colleague Shar Hashimov, who is in the audience today, we interviewed social media activists of Dushanbe, and some of the results of these interviews and of my work will be reflected in today's presentation. So the first dimension um, that I would like to cover is the dimension of power and production of space. Uh, so the, the two main top-down rationales behind this urban transformation are, of course, as already mentioned by other speakers, um, are linked to both economic and um, ideological rationale. So the economic rationale is linked um, in my study to study of political economy, which is basically, as we discussed, profit making by the states and private capital, which are often mixed and interlinked in Tajikistan. But on a higher level, it is linked to creation of the cities that is attractive for global investment, commerce, and tourism through the construction of the capitalist urban infrastructure that includes business centers, small, etc as well as through privatization of land. So um, in my study, I explore the effects of capitalism and neoliberalist policies on urban environment in the context of Central Asia. Um, demolition of historic housing and architecture is not unique to Central Asia. And I think in our discussion um, of this issue, we shouldn't pretend that it's just unique to Central Asia. Uh, it is feature of global capitalism, and this process is well documented in various parts of the, parts of the world, including global South countries like China and India, uh, countries of Africa, Middle East, and Latin America. Gentrification is happening um, here in, in my backyard in downtown Vancouver, where um, there's like increasing gentrification and displacement of residents from the historic Chinatown district. And Vancouver has a problematic history with urban development as well although now it's this iconic place for urban development and architecture. The second rationale is um, ideological and national, which is manufacturing, construction, and reproduction of a national identity through the construction of new administrative buildings um, that represent state power and a process in which city becomes a spectacle that projects this newly articulated notion um, of modernity, nation, and identity, both for local and global audiences. 
The second dimension that I would like to talk about and focus in today's presentation is um, resistance and social construction of space. So it's important to note the inability of influencing the process, this urban transformation process from the bottom up in the current political environment for majority of citizens and residents of Dushanbe. Process involves forceful displacement, um, evictions, lack of public output into the process and secrecy behind most construction projects. When I was conducting my interviews in Dushanbe among the policymakers and I was asking them about the Gen plan, they were like, no, 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 Gen plan is a secret. You, you can't have access to it. So it is, it is definitely an issue, but um, they're bottom-up narratives, which are debates and discourses that are reflective of historically rooted complexities of this place. These narratives that are driven by residents are dynamic, they're constantly changing, and they need to be um, studied and contextualized. So here um, I'm turning to the concept of social construction of space, which explains how meaning is inscribed in the landscape and built environment as well as the role that politics, unstable meetings, and culture play in placemaking. So now I'll just um, start talking about these three main narratives that um, I was able to discover during my interviews. So the first uh, narrative is the preservation narrative, is the one that is most familiar to us. Um, in Dushanbe specifically, this narrative is driven by primarily native residents of Dushanbe, often from an older generation who feel personal connection um, as well as links to these places and they're linked with connect collective and individual memories. For this group of people, the Chambet transformation feels the most traumatic. They, they have the feeling of being forgotten and ignored um, in the nation building process. They use phrases such as our past is being erased, um, they're violating our memories. This group is both privileged in terms of their ability to speak to international community and diaspora, and most of them are Russian speaking and educated middle class people, but they're also becoming increasingly linguistically and culturally marginalized in Tajikistan, where Tajik language is becoming more and more common. However, this group often reflects elitist attitude to rural newcomers to the city, especially to newcomers from the south of the country and they construct their identity based on juxtaposition um, of themselves with the new Tajik speaking residents of Dushanbe. Um, they often use the word Panayahane. And just if you're familiar with the context of that region, you'll know the, how problematic this word is. For this group um, of people, the definition of modernity is based on notions of Soviet and European modernity. And they often have a very Eurocentric vision of urban life. In interviews, this group often compares Dushanbe to St. Petersburg of Asia or Paris of Asia, um, kind of demonstrating their cultural affinity. One of the brightest examples of this group is um, a historian, Gafur Sharmatov, who um, has been gathering diaspora and local residents um, around his preservation work. And we can talk more about his um, activism later in the Q&A. So the second narrative is the celebratory narrative. It's mostly expressed by people who do not have strong attachment to the old city and are either young or moved to Dushanbe from other towns or rural areas. While not as vocal on the issue of urban transformation um, on social media and among international community, this group tends to generally welcome the changes and sees them as an indicator of Tajikistan's development and symbolic prosperity, which doesn't always reflect in their own experiences and well-being. People from this group tend to compare new Dushanbe to Dubai, um, Urumqi, or Kuala Lumpur, or other Asian or Eastern cities. They don't tend to see Dushanbe as a European city, like the first group, and they welcome Islamic and Asian symbolism and architecture. We often talk about evictions and how unfair they are, which for the most part they are, but there are people who were actually pleased with the conditions of their new housing and view these changes as positive. And I think we should also consider that narrative. Um, one of the interviewees told me, foreigners and Russians want to save our historic heritage, but we residents want to have good life and good conditions right now. So the third um, and one of the most interesting narratives um, is emerging community of youth uh, and, and their social media accounts. Mostly born after Tajikistan's independence in 1991, they're connected to both the old and new Dushanbe in a very different way. Um, the vision they these new generation have about their modernity and development and identity is drastically different from the older city residents and diaspora. And although, again, there are no political mechanisms for them 
To influence the process directly, they often turn to social media to document and discuss recent changes in their city and they use social media profiles to challenge and negotiate the narrative surrounding um, development on social media. One of the examples that you can see on this slide is a um, young social media activist, Aziza Kosimova, her project Youth in Dushanbe focuses on disappearing Soviet architecture and the last remaining iconic Soviet buildings such as Chahan Arohat and Sadrudina Emin Theater. Kosimova is very critical of the older generation, as she calls it, who um, in, her, in her words only reminisce about the past but haven't been successful in protecting the heritage for the next generation. But she's also critical of the new developments in the city that disregard history. She believes that social media projects like hers are important as they allow people of different generations to voice their opinions and have constructive discussions. Um, so I'm almost done. This is uh, just two examples of social media accounts curated by young social media um, activists and users in Dushanbe, both on Instagram and VK. Uh, both of these and there are several other accounts um, show people's interaction with these new different environments. In the images, you can see young people um, appropriating both old and new spaces of Dushanbe and they produce new meanings and memories around them. And I have two um, quotes here, but we'll probably get to them later. Yeah, we're definitely keen to come back to some of these in uh, uh, in the Q&A, but... Um, sure, yeah, yeah. I'll just have one slide and then take one slide, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so what are our takeaways from this presentation? Um, when we want to preserve our cities, I think we should ask ourselves the question, who we're preserving it from and who we're preserving it for. Urban transformation of Dushanbe is a complex issue that involves dimensions of power and social justice. Um, what's happening in Dushanbe is not an isolated phenomenon and needs to be linked to not just regional, but also global processes. Um, it, I strongly believe that it cannot be just contributed to local corruption, human rights issues, and authoritarianism as it's often framed. Um, theoretically, Dushanbe's transformation can be a source of much deeper analysis of these topics. And, um, and finally, we need to give more voice to local residents and activists, uh, not just in our research, but in our work to avoid reductionism in understanding the urban transformation of Dushanbe and Central Asia. I'm done. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Tamina. Um, what's been interesting is the through line, both from what you've said and uh, Zenia said, and also what I know um, uh, Mira has raised previously, is the lack of transparency around the master plans and the, the, the general plans of the cities. And suddenly, yeah, so developments can suddenly appear out of nowhere for residents uh, without proper consultation because they don't have clarity over what the, what the city's actually It's planning. interesting, but it's not always the, the point of the whole process. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, but, but perhaps you know, I think one of the things we've seen, as, as you say, some people, if you are provided with a better house at the end of a, 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 a redevelopment process, you may well want to uh, build the overall thing as beneficial, but it's about making sure you have enough time, warning and consultation and, 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 and feed in as I know there were a lot of issues with that in Uzbekistan um, uh, previously. Um, anyway, delighted to now move to uh, Kyrgyzstan and uh, bring in uh, Emil. Do you want to go? So I was going to say Emil doesn't need any introduction because he's a, uh, uh, but, uh, but he's uh, Emil Azradeep who is going to speak to us now. Um, thank you very much, Adam. Yeah, uh, I would like to present the uh, work that we are currently doing with my colleagues uh, from the Social Innovations Lab Kyrgyzstan, Silk, uh, that is a research center at the American University. Central Asia and um, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Seth Thiri, is uh, currently with us, so he can also engage in, in the discussion. Um, and uh, this was done uh, also with the help of our students from the Redesign in the Commons course. And this is also done with the help uh, with the collaboration of Bishkek uh, Chief Architect Bureau, right? And I would like to start with a little bit of history. Um, if you look at the uh, map of the Chu Valley, uh, you will see and uh, location of the early settlements. You can see that they're all located at the intersections of um, the rivers, right? Uh, going uh, from the mountains to the Chu River and the, um, the tract of the old ancient Silk Road. And one of these settlements was called Jul, right, and was located uh, neck between the Alamedin and Alarcha River. Uh, and uh, in the 19th century, uh, the settlement was uh, turned into a coconut fortress uh, by the name of uh, Pishpek, right? 
uh, it um, existed for about 40 years until it was taken over by the Russian army and the um, uh, new Russian city was built and you can see the location of the old fortress. And uh, so the Russian city was built exactly between the two rivers, right? Alamedin and Alarcha. And if you look at the old map, you can see that at the time there were not just two rivers, but there were like seven major streams flowing through uh, the territory of the city. And this is a, a marketplace, right? Uh, which was located right next Next to the um, Alamedin River. And so we can see that from the old times already, uh, rivers were important social places. Then uh, in the Soviet time, you know, uh, you see this, this, is, this map shows how the city has expanded from uh, the old fortress to the Russian city and the uh, new uh, territory. So uh, what the city planners did, the Soviet planners, uh, they, they, they tried to dry the area through uh, building uh, the um, reinforcing the riverbanks with concrete, but also creating a system of east west oriented canals right so they built four canals. Um, and so this way they were able to uh, drain the place right and also uh, organized a proper uh, irrigation system. Um, yeah, and uh, if you look at uh, some of the major engineering um, solutions, right, you can see that the banks were reinforced by concrete, um, right, um, uh, this is the section, you know, a cross section of the river, uh, but you also see a system of dissipation walls, you know, located at about 60 to 80 meters from each other, uh, the purpose of which was to reduce the speed of water and to prevent the soil from washing away. Um, and then also uh, rivers in, in the Soviet time obtained the status of the technical engineering urban elements. And uh, what was really important, right, is that there was a 150 meter red corridor established along the uh, rivers, right, that forbid bend any kind of uh, construction in that uh, space. Uh, also, uh, there was an uninterrupted access through the entire length of the river, and there were sidewalks built on both uh, sides of the rivers uh, along the entire length. Right? And uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so, and then in the post-Soviet time, uh, the city has expanded again, but not that significantly. Here you see the new uh, additional areas. Uh, but then what happened, right, is that in the time of uh, post-Soviet chaos and corruption, particularly with the mayor's office and the chief architect's office. Uh, the, uh, this red zone along the river was reduced from 100 meters to only six meters from the bank. And uh, um, even in many locations, in many areas, even that area, that uh, norm was not um, um, you know, followed. And uh, uh, lots of areas uh, along the river was actually, were actually taken over by private houses, but also by uh, some industries. And also you see quite a lot of trashing of the riverbanks by local residents and by construction companies. A lot of, a lot of uh, construction garbage uh, ended up uh, in the rivers. And so uh, if you look at the river now, right, uh, all these red uh, lines, they show the areas which are currently completely inaccessible uh, for uh, pedestrians, right? So the green areas are actually areas uh, with the proper uh, sidewalks, and then um, the blue ones uh, and the yellow one and the blue, yeah, um, white ones show different types of quality, right? But you can see if you look at the overall diagram, we can see that almost 30% uh, or nearly one third of the river is currently inaccessible to pedestrians. Yet people still come to the river, and you can see that certain segments are particularly popular, especially those that are well, more or less um, well maintained. Um, and people come here mostly for walking, for meeting friends, and uh, they also come here to meet with the family, from with 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 uh, friends again, family members, relatives. And what attracts people most to the river is the water, right? Uh, this is very important, an opportunity for recreation and socialization and greenery. And these things are really important. So in in our research, we did a little bit of uh, analysis of one of the rivers, right, Alarcha River, right? So we have uh, identified several major segments along the river. And you can see um, um, that the, so how the river goes through all of the different uh, contexts in the city. And that uh, that is what makes it really interesting and diverse. Um, there's a lot of uh, diversity in terms of the types of green spaces along the river. Uh, the river is quite well connected right through the bridges like uh, this map shows the connectivity of the two banks um, and um, if you look um, yeah uh, sort of there are several segments that we have identified there is one area that has a lot of uh, authentic green areas and the park uh, there is one area where the river goes through uh, uh, micro uh, districts and very dense residential areas 
And uh, this area also has a lot of educational uh, institutions along the river, such as uh, schools and universities. Uh, then the second area is uh, the area of the industrial zone, um, where on one side of the river you have um, a uh, factory of uh, by, uh, by uh, named after the Lenin, and then on the other si side of the factory you have Rabochi uh, Garadok, right? Residential areas for the workers, and then uh, another area is what we call urban jungle, is where the river goes through uh, the bazaar, right? And it's so densely built that there's simply no um, sidewalks on either side of the river. And then the final uh, piece of the river is what we call um, a village in the city, right? Uh, again, this is where it goes through a very uh, low um, densely uh, populated residential areas. So we have some of the recommendations, but I might just skip through them, like saving the wi wild authentic kind of character of the eco zone, um, plant planting more trees in the um, micro district area, removing some of the visual barriers along the rivers, uh, creating an amphitheater, um, opening the passages on both sides of uh, the river near the bazaar and actually turning the bazaar to face the river and rather than uh, turning away from it. And then uh, creating a prominent in the village and opening up the Kyrgyz film uh, territory to people and creating museum on it. Additionally, we are proposing to create some activity, socialization, recreation, recreation anchors along the river and uh, restore river beds and banks because there are a number of places where the, um, their uh, condition is quite hazardous. So um, uh, then we had our bigger vision and the motivation for this vision was this uh, project that actually the Atlanta Beltline where um, um, the planners turned a former uh, railway that was circling the city into a pedestrian bike, biking zone and uh, which became very popular. So we, uh, a colleague of ours, Medir Ahmedov, who is an architect, proposed this idea of uh, Bishkek eco Belt as well, right? Uh, that would uh, unite, um, turn sort of the rivers and the canals into a large ring uh, that would uh, reconnect all different spaces of the city into one integrated system of blue and green spaces. And so what we are doing now, we are working with the Chief Architects Bureau, right? And uh, we have produced this new vision, which is called Kok Bishkek. And the name Kok in Kyrgyz is quite inclusive. It includes blue, uh, like meaning blue sky, but also uh, blue water and, uh, and also uh, green uh, spaces, like uh, Kok Terek, like green uh, trees or green lawns, etc. cetera. And uh, so the, the, the purpose, the vision, our vision in, includes a kind of the um, saving, uh, preserving and further developing uh, the green and blue infrastructure uh, of Bishkek uh, in order to create an open green reconnected uh, kind of uh, public space uh, that would allow people to um, reclaim uh, the city, right, and um, uh, take it back from the cars. And um, one of the um, uh, mistakes, uh, sort of the, the chief architects bureau tried to work in the same direction before, uh, but they failed because um, they mostly, I mean, they created this PDP, uh, the project of detailed planning, uh, that they simply imposed, you know, from above, and uh, the, uh, the, the 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 plan was taken to the court and cancelled by the court. And uh, the main reason why that happened is was because the uh, the the institute was working mostly from above, right, uh, from top down. So what we are doing now, right, we are going actually vice versa. We're going bottom up. Every week we have, we are conducting meetings with different communities. With the uh, so far we had the meetings with ecologists, bikers, runners, um, um, bloggers. Um, and uh, we have a number of other meetings scheduled ahead of us, right? And the purpose is uh, uh, of these meetings is to uh, both um, help us get the feedback from different communities to build the vision, but also to popularize it. So let me stop here. I think uh, my 10 minutes are passed uh, and then we can come back to this during the um, Q&A session. Well, thank you so much. But and, and, and I think you've left us on a really important point there about the, the centrality of getting residents involved in shaping what happens to their city and I think that's uh, that's absolutely key and I'd be fascinated to know maybe in the Q&A to what extent obviously the architects bureau are involved to what extent the city authorities at a top level are in uh, politically invested in this project and whether there is you know they're willing to put the funds available make the funds available to deliver this um because it's obviously you know essentially got quite wide-ranging public benefits but not necessarily 
but direct benefits to some of the more entrenched insider groups that obviously uh, Xenia and Dilmira have focused on in terms of how change happens in those cities. Um, but so it's encouraging to hear that, that there is at least still some political buy-in on that in, in Kyrgyzstan. Um, right, uh, our final uh, speaker of this initial session is uh, Adil uh, Nomakov uh, from the Urban Forum of Kazakhstan. But before I ask uh, Adil to take the floor, just to remind people uh, to please put your questions into the Q and, uh, into the chat function uh, so that once uh, Adil is finished speaking, we can uh, pick out some of those questions and ask the panel. Um, but uh, Adil, uh, take it away, please. Hello, thank you. Do you hear me well? Great. Uh, thanks for inviting. Uh, I uh, represent Urban Forum Kazakhstan. This is a public foundation based in Almaty. Uh, it was yeah, it was fascinating to uh, listen to all the speakers that uh, uh, preceded me. And uh, here is the, the situation in Kazakhstan. I will. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, my I don't have a presentation, I don't have visual aid, uh, sorry for that. Uh, so yeah, bear just my face. Uh, so in Kazakhstan, they, the uh, importance of uh, historical layers in architecture and urban fabric has risen significantly in Kazakhstan over the past few years. I can say that this process was taking place in front of my eyes while my team and I have been working at the Urban Forum Kazakhstan Foundation since 2015. The work done by us, our partners and friendly initiatives has shifted the oblivious indifference of public opinion, opinion to a more watchful awareness. Advocacy campaigns, various formats of uh, dialogue platforms and educational projects are changing the public perception of heritage and fair shared city, turning the underground fringe debates into a mainstream discourse. This is especially relevant to this so-called recent heritage, uh, Soviet constructivist, neoclassic and modernist architecture. There were two important cases of restoration of iconic modernist uh, brutalist buildings in Almaty uh, in 2010, uh, the, the, Republic of Pal uh, the, the, the pa Republic Palace, yeah, right, and the uh, TV Studios Pavilion in 2019. Uh, the first one was made without public oversight with complete makeover of the facades and the other made with vibrant expert and public engagement that made it possible to preserve the building's appearance. Uh, there is a common belief that it, uh, it would have been impossible to accomplish the 2010 uh, project today the way it was made 10 years ago. Uh, the shift in public perception has taken place right in time uh, because for many in Kazakhstan, and uh, as uh, I uh, understand in, in Central Asia, recent heritage is uh, for many is synonymous to colonial legacy. And these kind of sentiments were voiced quite often until recently uh, that we should get rid of physical objects that serve as reminders of Soviet regime. Uh, so, but clearly that in absence of significant uh, architectural history, national architectural history, this reasoning uh, eventually led to uncritical justification of any kitsch pushed forward by big capital, be it local construction companies or foreign star architects, uh, the, way, the way, for example, our new capital is uh, developing. So uh, urban grassroots initiatives, expert groups and professional communities volunteered a lot to stir the discussion around identity, collective memory and societal self-reflection on heritage. It started in Almaty, the former capital city, uh, but many more initiatives are following this path in Astana, Artrao, Paraganda, and the other cities of Kazakhstan, standing up to protect recent heritage. Currently, uh, there is a new policy, uh, building up momentum, which is renovation of obsolete housing. Uh, the renovation policy is, uh, uh, Basically, uh, in simple terms, it is uh, uh, taking low-rise houses built in 1940s to 50s, uh, get them erased in bulk and replace uh, with massive multi-story complexes. Uh, there is a big share of truly poor housing buildings 
Uh, many of them had been built as temporary housing, but the policy uh, is promoting demolition of whole quarters and blocks without public consultations, without technical assessment, with no clear strategy to improve the, the urban fabric. Uh, the policy uh, pushed forward by local authorities and construction companies is fueled by imperfections of not national economy and governance. And uh, let me explain what are they. So firstly, the oil-driven economy provides almost no investment alternatives for big capital, apart from highly lucrative construction of housing, real estate. Uh, the construction sector is the main booster of national economy, second only to extractive industries, which are certainly not relevant for cities. So encouraging construction uh, bubble is the only way uh, to boost urban economy. Secondly, the local administrations seek quick wins in uh, macroeconomic and statistical terms, uh, quick wins that they can report back to the center and get promotion. So what are uh, those uh, quick wins, like more jobs? Uh, they're uh, very short term, uh, but uh, this is something they can report uh, to the center. So more jobs, more investments, more taxes, more square meters of housing, more red ribbons cut. to cut. <clears throat> Most heads of local administrations see their positions as very temporary transfer stops on the way to the central government. So a lot of effort is being made by them to please the capital and, uh, and, uh, and uh, pr uh, pr promote this renovation uh, policy. In ideological terms, renovation of obsolete housing is less charged. There are not so many sentiments on fighting Sovietism in the built environment for the sake of new national identity. More emphasis is uh, being made on pragmatic arguments, uh, but they don't help much when it gets to the work with communities and neighborhoods that are subject to renovation. Uh, there is a, a clear lack of empathy uh, uh, to a resident's uh, no engagement and uh, almost no participation even uh, I would say almost no, uh, not enough information about the, about the, uh, the plan for, the, for, the, for their neighborhoods. So in most, in most cases, the outcome is uh, erased identity, distorted urban fabric, aggravated transport and environmental problems, lower quality of life, lower access to social infrastructure and less human scale development. Uh, in 2020, uh, Urban Forum Kazakhstan held the first of a kind multidisciplinary research of two locations in Almaty that are subject to renovation. And as I speak, we are final, finalizing the second installment of this project where we analyzed two locations that were renovated recently. And uh, I can talk for hours about this work, uh, this, this work, uh, which is uh, a matter of big pride of, for us, but I would rather leave it for the Q&A session. Uh, also, there, there are two ladies attending the session who headed uh, the architecture team and sociology slash anthropology uh, team of the research. Hello, Alina. Hello, Zarina. Uh, so they uh, did a lot of data collection and analysis. They held focus groups and architecture charrettes with residents. And uh, so this is an ongoing project, uh, which uh, uh, is now uh, getting uh, to the track of advocacy from the from the from the research to advocacy. So uh, I I can't uh, share a lot of um, outcomes of this project uh, uh, apart from the from the from the from the knowledge that we got. Uh, so the, uh, not not so many changes. Uh, so far, but uh, a lot of knowledge. So I, I, I would stop here. Thank you so much, uh, Adil. And thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously yeah, local differences in each country, but a lot of commonalities across the region in terms of the sort of tra big trends and forces that are uh, at play, um, particularly given the, the nature of authority and governance in, in, in uh, certainly three slash four of the, uh, the, 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 the country we're talking about. We'll, we'll, we'll leave case one slightly open at the moment um but uh it can, if people can please put their comments in the uh the chat um i've got uh, a question 
just now. Um, uh, and again, panelists don't feel you need to answer all the questions that come in, um, but we'll, we'll sort of pick things up as, as people um, uh, either direct them to you or, or, or seem appropriate. Um, the question uh, from uh, Begame, um, specifically for Tamina, but I know this will be relevant to um, Dilmira as well, and maybe some others, um, the regarding young social media activists, um, was there, particularly in the case, in the in the sort of third group that you identified in your presentation, Tamina, um, they asked, uh, Begame asked, was there a case where um, they're able to work together with the people in power in order to affect how the city shapes. So how responsive were the city authorities to those social media organized groups, um, specifically in Dishrepo? So um, thank you for the question. It's a good one and it made me think um, when I first saw it. Uh, I think in regards to the third group that I was describing, they um, it's, it's a very recent phenomenon and these accounts are quite fresh. They're either like one or two years old at most and these are very young people that we were talking about they're not they're university students so they're just starting their career and they're not necessarily um politically mobilized to the extent to be engaged with power i'm sure there were some levels that they could kind of like shape the way certain um certain spaces were either like designed or organized um but yeah i don't i don't see their efforts um, manifesting in any actual change at the moment but i definitely see the potential there because one of them was um an architect a young woman architect and um she she has quite strong positions about the, the change so i think with time um they will show their potential but uh, in other groups uh, in the first group that i talked about Gafur Sharmatov, and a lot of people um around him i know that they had a direct input in what kind, what buildings are going to be preserved in Dushanbe and what buildings are going to be considered a historic heritage. So there's that. Thank you. Um, Eira, do you want to come in on the social media activism in uh, in Uzbekistan around these issues? Yes, yeah, yeah, um, uh, definitely. Um, there, there are um, a lot of, um, there, there's a lot of activism going on on social media and also the initiatives, um, formal and informal. Formal ones, uh, the, the the ones that, that centers documentary resources that combine uh, different forms of art activism and advocacy. Uh, the, an example would be um, uh, one thirty nine documentary center by Tumur Karpov, who's an activist, and also advocates for um, preservation of the uh, historic um, settlements like Mahalas. Um, so in terms of Facebook groups, I think we are familiar with them and we have a larger group, um, particularly on demol demolitions, it's called Tashkent Demolition, Tashkent Snows, um, led by the administrator and activist uh, Farida Shalafil. Um, he has a lot, I mean, more than 25,000 users, active users who are discussing and suggesting ideas or just, you know, uh, expressing their um, opinions in the group. And, do you, and would you would you say that um, Frida's obviously Frida's work has got a lot of attention uh, and and got a lot of people mobilised? To uh, can you point to any successes that those groups have had, that her group or other groups have had in terms of stopping demolitions or or, or things like, or similarly with the blue domes that you talked about earlier? In terms of, is there any sense that the authorities have changed course as a result of that activism? Uh, definitely, yes. Uh, there are some, or the, the one example I, uh, in terms of the park, uh, the green spaces I, uh, I mentioned, uh, well, is uh, in a way a success story because uh, that has been going for uh, a few months. And in the end, um, it seems like the civil society has won the case and, and the, the, the place for the monument has changed. So the park stays um, in a way. So the group, uh, the this community uh, of actors um, has, you know, succeeded in a way. Um, uh, as for the Tashkent Demolition Group, um, uh, they have participated in many cases. Uh, the one being is a historic home of, on Babur Street um, in Tashkent that was also preserved. Uh, it was a success story, but that was going on for years, like with the Ministry of Culture, but, but the government um, was, you know, fighting for. <laughs> Uh, heritage basically there, there are cases uh, that you know um have been impacted by the civil society uh, and activist groups who have been fighting 
but it's but I, but I suppose it's interesting. It's quite often been, it's been pressure on the authorities rather than the authorities taking reaching out to these groups as a consultative body in the way that Emil's. Um, ah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, that is a little different bit from uh, Dr. Um, uh, in Sweden. I think, uh, in a way, that uh, um, there are uh, groups, activist groups, and advocacy groups, um, but uh, in terms of you know giving recommendations, uh, the initiatives, I think there are not many in Uzbekistan and Tashkent, but there is research. I mean, there are researchers, architects who do research, and uh, they have been working as consultants for the e-commerce um, UNESCO uh, National Committee in Uzbekistan as an expert's uh, opinion. I mean, not only opinion, but expertise. They were giving, providing intelligence, providing expertise in terms of architecture, uh, historic preservation, um, and particularly, yeah, the, the, the historical settlements. Brilliant. Um, I mean, does anyone else want to come in on, on the particular point about informal groups? Um, you may also want to answer in relation to uh, Radomir's question, which is about you know, he, he, he says it seems that all civic initiatives have an inform all these civic initiatives have an informal character. Are there any specific NGOs to protect people from demolition and eviction? So we talked about some of the Facebook groups. Are in, in some of the other country countries are there more established NGOs and uh, or organisations that are active? Uh, Sonia, do you want to come in? Yeah, sure. So uh, the one uh, which I presented previously is uh, the Independent Center for Human Rights Protection. It is located in uh, Dushanbe, and I'm going to share uh, the link with you, the particular link. So this organization, they're actually involved in, um, uh, in uh, solving a lot of issues like uh, uh, the issues of torture happening in uh, Tajikistan, the issues of uh, legal, uh, of different kind of legal protection in regards to uh, violations uh, of uh, the rights of journalists and uh, violations in terms of housing, in particular, uh, in particular, um, uh, forced evictions and uh, demolitions. And uh, so they are providing people, the post evicted with uh, the lawyers who are making uh, this legal assistance pro bono. And um, uh, this is uh, the, uh, this organization is the local one, but there are also different uh, international organizations which, uh, which are based in uh, Dushanbe uh, and which are involved in uh, this kind of uh, protection of uh, possibly evicted. Uh, the one is uh, uh, the Soros Foundation Tajikistan, the Open Society Institute Assistance Foundation. They are actually funding this kind of, uh, they provide, I mean, they are providing grants uh, to this kind of uh, organizations like uh, Independent Center for Human Rights Protection. And uh, I'm not sure, uh, but maybe we should also look at uh, their, uh, their agenda of the United Nations, UNDP, which is located in Dushanbe, probably they are also making uh, some kind of assistance. So I'm going to send you the link to that chat. Yeah, yeah, but that's great, please do put that in the chat. I mean, I think, I think a lot of, uh, we, we've mentioned UNESCO, we've mentioned the UNDP, I would also, from the research we did recently, mention the, uh, the development banks. Yeah, I think there needs to be a, a, a concerted effort by all the external partners that are putting money into uh, these countries to make sure that the projects that they're doing are you know, being supported by the local community and, and engaging with the local community rather than um, sort of driving change um, without their consultation and participation. Um, Emil or uh, Adil, do you want to come in on any of this point about formal or informal? Actually, uh, our uh, project is not trying to um... Uh, save people from eviction or demolition. Our project is actually trying to demolish quite a lot of properties which were illegally uh, built uh, next to the rivers. Yeah, uh, And so these were clearly done against the law. And uh, we understand that people have some <laughs> interest, you know, in having this access to the rivers. Uh, but uh, this works against actually people's will and uh, it blocks people's access to the rivers and passages along the rivers. So this is one of the main challenges. But 
Yeah, so um, one of the tasks is basically to figure out how we can push the fences back. Uh, but uh, in terms of um, organizations, yeah, actually, um, like our partnership is directly with the chief architect's office, right? And we are lucky to have someone uh, in the chief architect position who uh, has the smallest progressive, modernist, and um, um, uh, views uh, the, and, and, and wants to do something in, um, you know, uh, for the people rather than uh, for the businesses, right? And uh, we don't know how long he's going to take stand in that position. You know, this uh, it's uh, the, the degree of rotation is quite high. So we hope he, he stays long and we manage to push this forward. Um, otherwise, yeah, there is a number of organizations involved, uh, sort of us, uh, then there's a, a initiative, um, public initiative, Archa, or the ecologists and botanists, and then um, the mayor's office, the National Institute for um, Urban Planning, um, uh, and, and a number of other partners. Yeah, so it's it's quite institutional. It's not just completely informal. Yeah, and I think that's, yeah, and as you said, things are changing fast in, in, in Kyrgyzstan in terms of the, obviously you had a change of mayor at the end of last year and stuff like that. So um, let, let's let's hope that, that approach to consultation cont continues. Um, Adil, do you want to come in on this or um, should I bring you on, on the next one? Okay, uh, in which case I will uh, go to uh, Seth uh, Fury's question. Um, to what extent are new developments taking into account uh, environmental sustainability? Um, and are there historic methods of water conservation that can or are being brought back? Um, so, do want, so to what extent is so in sustainability being considered as part of these uh, developments? And I mean, I think I've got some answers from some of the countries, but I, I'd be interested to know. Anyone want to come in on sustainability? No, it's a, it's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, I think... Yeah, well, I can talk. No, please, 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 please. Well, I had an example, actually, of the uh, new metro, <laughs> uh, which is um, falling apart in a way. Um, flying in the like in the winds um of that, that that tells something about the sustainability um, uh, because of the uh, lack of transparency I, I would just argue that this is very very important in, in planning um, um and equally important as many other aspects that we look into because you don't have transparency and good governance you don't know what's happening basically and then people may uh, become victims of like Sardaba Dam, for instance, the collapse, a metro might collapse tomorrow. Um, well, environmental effects would be also, I think we could consider ecology, the, the green spaces, whenever there is new um, infill development between the houses. So mm -hmm, the green spaces are removed and the playgrounds are removed. Basically, there is no space. So in a, in a way, that that affects the the ecosystem of the I think the urban spaces. Um, yeah, I think well in general I think I, we have to ensure um, participatory democratic planning, and we cannot do that without governments, without open society, open government and transparency. I think I don't know if so. While I research this, or I've been doing this for um, years now, I came to this. Then, quite pessimistic kind of uh, diagnostic because I know if without that, you cannot change. You have to have the power to plan. If we don't have the power to plan, we cannot preserve the historical heritage. We cannot take the authority from them who are doing harm, be it social, economic, political, ecological, can be anything. We cannot do that without the power of having the participation. I think also um, Adil mentioned about the lack of participation, the lack of uh, sort of um, kind of a voice. Well, in a, they don't listen, but I mean, you have autocratic governments, like in situations, there is top-down planning. Planning is also autocratic in a way. So there's, I think we have to consider those issues without that, I think we can't impact planning. I think I mean uh, maybe we'll we'll continue on this issue on this theme because it was a question I was about to ask. We can maybe pivot back to the question of sustainability in a second. But it's the question about power and control. And yeah, Adil mentioned that 
local government is a waypoint on your rise up to power in uh, in Kazakhstan. Uh, so it's a short term thing. Do well, you please your uh, the, the masters at the top get promoted into national politics. Kyrgyzstan, I think there is has been a degree of separation between some of the local governments and some of the, 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 the national government in terms of there not being a pathway, it's not being a direct, automatically a direct pathway into parliament. And and in but in 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 in, in Tajikistan you obviously have the son of the uh, 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 of the leader as your as your mayor and in and, and in and it is in Tashkent you have a a, a very well politically connected uh, mayor who's been brought in from the top so a top down in position in both Tajikistan and uh, and, and, and 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 Uzbekistan so I'd be interested to know so how other panelists think about how you could reform. But what ways, given the broader social and political structures that are in place in those countries, what are mechanisms that you could see to try and nudge and push these to local authorities to be more responsive to local citizens? Is there anything other any is there normal what's coming on that, that point around local voice and, and local um yeah, responsiveness? Anyone? Um. Uh, I, I can try just to start with them. Um, I, I think um, there is a, a, a major difference between um, uh, <laughs> the countries in the region, yeah, and obviously um, what's happening in Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and to some degree in Kazakhstan is very different uh, than what is happening here. Right? Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, there is the space for activism. Uh, the space for civic engagement is much stronger, right? And we wouldn't be able to do what we are doing currently um, if um, um, if we were uh, in the context like Uzbekistan or Tajikistan. And sort of one of the reasons why the uh, the chief architect's office and uh, the Institute for Urban Planning are open for collaboration and actually seeking our help with uh, engaging community is because they understand that uh, they can <laughs> they can no longer pass their laws and. Uh, norms without the approval of citizens. Like, uh, for example, the law that they have uh, produced you know, uh, was cancelled in the higher court because the citizens challenged it. Right? So, um, yeah, and so there is this uh, space for um, activism, space for engagement, space for a dialogue uh, is present here, right? And that's what makes us hopeful. Yeah, uh, we are kind of behind everyone in terms of resources <laughs> uh, uh, and finances, but um, a bit ahead of everyone in terms of um, activism. So uh, that's what makes us a, a little bit more hopeful. And, and I think I hope that we can catch up, you know, in terms of um, spaces and uh, infrastructure of the city. So yeah, uh, this um, the, the good context, I guess, the level of uh, political freedom and liberty is important. Definitely, um, brilliant. Um, well, yeah, definitely. I just wanted to comment on uh, uh, Emil. I, I was just referring when I said, you know, top, you know, top bottom, like it. So I was referring to the countries uh, Tajikistan. Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. So yeah, obviously there is more space. There's a lot more space in Kyrgyzstan and Bishkek. And I've lived in Bishkek myself, so I'm familiar with that. Well, and that's great. Well, let's, let's, let's hope it continues to me now. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about how um, to think of this residents or citizens activism. And I feel for me, it's divided into kind of two levels. One is um, initiatives to preserve historical heritage. And another one are efforts of, of residents to protect their housing. Um, I feel they kind of belong into two realms. While the first one is kind of a question of privilege, like based on um, what, um, what I discovered during my interviews, is the people who just want to preserve things just for the sake of it, just to preserve history, just to preserve their culture and their own memories. So it's more of an emotional endeavor and um, more of a cultural endeavor while people are protecting their housing and uh, protesting evictions um, are doing it out of necessity. It, they're, they're feeling kind of desperate because um, as Adam mentioned earlier, they're just like notified and they have to move out like in a matter of weeks. So those initiatives are quite different and they should be done in different ways. And um, I just want to note that they're all, the citizens are already, residents are already pushing back like I have experience from like my friends and my parents who um, who were notified that they will be evicted and their building is being demolished. 
And it's really um, case on case basis. So if you get a better developer, you can negotiate with them. If you don't get a good developer, you can fight against them. So there are some mechanisms in place already and citizens aren't just like accepting their fate. Um, so there's already mobilization, there are already initiatives. Um, there was an example uh, on Bohoro 49, I think, a uh, building that was located near the first, the first school, like also in the center, central district of Dushanbe and residents, residents were just like evicted. Their house was being demolished before they even moved out. Um, and they documented everything on Facebook and they documented their meetings with authorities, with deputate, with um, the real estate developer. And in the end, they were able to negotiate better conditions for themselves. So um, I can say that there are no thing, there, there's nothing that people can do at the moment. They are doing things. And although we don't always see it, but resistance is there. And sometimes authorities are responsive to it. Yeah, no, 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 I'd be, be interested to know what you think, what, what tactics are most effective in getting the authorities to uh, to respond? I mean, Ad Ad Adil, you, you talked about the, sort of the nature of political power in Almaty. Is there anything you want to say from your experiences of how do you get, you know, what what can you do to make these um, politicians, local politicians who are on their career trajectory up to look down as well as as, as up to uh, up to the to, to the ruling elite? Adil, do you want to come in? You don't have to. I... Ah, okay. Um, well, well, no worries. I mean, does it? I mean, because we we're we're going to um, have to end the session in the not uh, too distant future. I know. Uh, does anyone else have, have any sort of closing remarks that they want to give? I know Zenia wanted to say a little bit more about what she thinks that should be done uh, in in a in a in the context of Tajikistan. But I'd be interested to know if anyone else wants to come in. Zenia. So just, just, okay. just a bottom of my uh, recommendations. Uh, the first one is, of course, to engage uh, um, civil society to involve it in uh, the discussion of uh, GAN plans, general plans, which uh, currently are not available for the uh, uh, general population. The second one, uh, the second recommendation was uh, to stop uh, forced evictions uh, and to, to um, to provide uh, tenants with the opportunity to uh, for for their uh, lucrative compensations and uh, to conduct some kind of work with the real estate developers who should uh, consider all uh, the rights which tenants have um, re regarding uh, their housing, their demolished housing. So it would be good to uh, stop uh, all the demolitions and uh, in order to uh, conduct additional uh, expert analysis of all buildings, because uh, uh, the buildings which are currently demolished, they are the old ones. The, um, mostly it is uh, the solid Soviet buildings. And uh, uh, also, it would, it would be good if uh, the government considers the opinion of uh, the majority of the civil society regarding uh, the destruction of uh, historical Soviet buildings. And uh, because um, like Tahmina explained before, uh, most of those who were born in Dushanbe, they, uh, they are trying to make their voices heard regarding uh, preservation of the rest of the Soviet era historical buildings. Um, then, uh, uh, speaking about other recommendations, they are about uh, uh, the system of uh, residency registration system. Uh, it is. It would be good if uh, the government considers uh, uh, the abolishing of uh, this uh, residency registration system, and um, if uh, these. Uh, government officials who are responsible for, uh, I mean, if uh, this residency registration system uh, preserves, then uh, those uh, government officials who are responsible for uh, helping people in solving their issues with uh, uh, their passports and propiska, uh, they should uh, arrange these registrations uh, um, of those living without propiska and passports, uh, uh, they should arrange their registrations in the re uh, reception centers under the Ministry of Internal Affairs. 
then uh, uh, it would be good if the government considers uh, bringing transparency and accountability uh, to the sector uh, to the sector of construction because uh, unfortunately uh, because of the lack of time i didn't explain uh, clearly what kind of uh, uh, corruption we have in the construction sector but of course you can read it in my uh, research uh, and uh, read uh, more particularly about uh, the cases which we have uh, in uh, in the construction sector. Thank you. So thank you, Zenia. Um, so just to add to that, both Zenia's and uh, Shora Ilimova's um, uh, pub, uh, essays in our collection uh, focus on those issues around um, the intersection between corruption and, and the built environment, um, which is definitely worth reading. Uh, I saw Tamina to wanted to come in. Uh, I think you uh, uh, said, do you think, and then Mira, and then. I may have misunderstood your comment uh, to me. Oh yeah, uh, I think Xenia summarized it pretty well. I just think uh, when we are discussing um, the tools and recommendations for what like people should do, I think it's um, up to local residents to decide and certainly not Western academics to like tell them what to do or like trying to imagine what should be done. So um, yeah, I do see resistance um, and activism on the, on the ground at the moment. So. I do believe that change is possible. And yeah, I agree with Xenia's recommendations. Brilliant, fantastic. Um, Mira. Yeah, I would again argue that the, the in terms of transparency government, um, as for Tajikistan as well, I could say for both Uzbekistan, they won't provide transparency because they are the ones that are involved in corruption. Um, well, for Uzbekistan, for instance, Ministry of Construction, recently found out, well, we, we knew this before, but um, he, he, is, uh, he and his family have uh, been using um, a lot of state aid to um, gain contracts, uh, projects without tender, uh, over $40 million, and, but all the, all the big projects around the Tashkent, if we see uh, any big palace, um, the constructed by Trust 12. Trust 12 is a construction company uh, that was led by the, the current Minister of Construction, uh, who is now denying that, that I have nothing to do with it. My family is not involved, but it is a fact that his family is involved and his wife and his wife and, and his son. And, so and, and I'm, I think I'm pretty sure that a similar situation can be observed in Tajikistan. So anyway, um, again, so I don't believe that the government will uh, act. What we can do is just the, again, the bottom up mobilization, um, creating database of finding out who is the owners, who are building this, who is the constructor, uh, who is the developer. And um, what, what, that's what we do within the um, OZ investigations initiative and in my research as well. We find out who owns it, who are sponsors it, who are the, benefit, the beneficiaries. Um, again, so corruption is not a local problem, I wouldn't call it, it's a transnational problem. That's why I think it's very important to act and also to cooperate with other in researchers who are doing similar work on the region because corruption is international and it's also um, good that we, we, we are having these events. Um, yeah, so basically what I'm not mobilization, creating hegemony of the people, um, the resistance. Uh, well, resistance is there, but supporting and empowering that um, and creating that hegemony over planning, I think is important. Thank yeah. you. Um, no, no worries. I mean, I think you're right, making sure that, that groups on social media are able to stay and grow. With, with well, more, more and more initiatives. And I mean, like uh, formal or on informal, doesn't matter. The, what matters is that they have ideas, they have database, they have, they're creating something that can be used in, you know, in, in the future. Um, sort of, you know, creating again. No, definitely. And, and, the, and one of the useful things that we can do from outside of the region is help with the trans transparency about who owns what, because, you know, a lot of them, exactly. a lot yeah. of the companies uh, suddenly find their way through either the UK or its uh, dependencies. And, uh, a lot in the UK, yeah. A lot in the UK and the US and Europe across the globe. So, so a lot more, we, a lot more we can do on that front. Uh, Emil, 
Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Adam, and uh, thank you, everyone, for um, wonderful uh, uh, recommendations and suggestions. From uh, my side, I would suggest that um, it's really important to have a good team, right? Um, uh, to be to have people who support you uh, in difficult times, particularly, uh, especially when the energy is low and when you need to push and push and push. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's I'm I'm like personally very lucky to have. Um, uh, great collaborators, partners in our uh, in, in our team and also outside of the team um, in other organizations um, who uh, think alike and actually support support and encourage each other. Uh, the second thing is to be a uh, recommendation is to be persistent and patient, like and ju just to um, basically chew the system bite by bite. You know, over the years, I mean, we've been working on the Rivers project for like, now more than five years. So we started with very small projects, with working with the communities renovated one river bank then uh, renovated uh, created a river park on the other side you know so um uh, and, and you have to understand that like projects like top bishkek would take uh, would not be uh, you know um, realized within one or two years it would take maybe 10 20 50, 30 years you know to to fully implement so the patience is very important and the third recommendation is basically to stay away from politics you know the politics are not bringing any any good uh, and it's like uh, it's all corruption and uh, it, it's all dirty so um and rather than uh, so what we are trying to do is rather than um Working against politicians, we are trying to work with the politicians. You know, uh, be to be smart and strategic. For example, um, uh, one way, um, like we understand that both the, uh, for example, the parties that are running for the uh, Bishkek City Council um, and um, also the uh, the country president, you know, actually. Uh, can uh, benefit a lot from uh, and um, and sort of we we try to wave on the so ride right on the way of populism yeah and so to uh, convince them that uh, they also are going to benefit from uh, the realization and building um, of such public spaces etc. And final recommendations is really to work with the communities I, I mean this is the core right, of everything uh, like uh, this is the most important thing right is that uh, yeah you have to meet and sort of as we, we we've been meeting for the last you know couple of years. Uh, like very regularly, and this project is, yeah, um, weekly meetings uh, with different communities, different uh, um, groups, and uh, this is really, really important. It helps uh, both, so sort of um, uh, strengthen the uh, the project, right? But also, uh, it encourages us to continue moving further, right? And it builds a popular support. But without the popular support today, yeah, um, you can't do anything. Absolutely. No, thanks, Emil. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, Adele, do you want to come in? He might have this. He may have. Last call for Adele. Last call for Kazakhstan. Going, going. Okay. Um, in which case, then, uh, Abahan, I will um, hand over to you to say some final words. But thank you very much for my side to a uh, really interesting panel. And there's a lot, lot we can take take forward. Uh, on what's been discussed today at home. Oh, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, they are all really, it was, I think, it was an incredible event. I had a great pleasure to listen to all of you. you know, I would like to extend my gratitude to everyone who joined the event today. Uh, I would like to thank our panel of speakers and the chair of today's event, uh, Dilmira Matyukubova, Ksenia Mironova, Tachmina Inayatova, Mina Sredinov, uh, Adil Nurmakov, and of course, uh, to Adam Hu uh, for facilitating uh, the discussion and raising many important questions. Uh, you really gave us uh, a great tool of uh, the issues and challenges around the current situation with destruction of historical heritage and chaotic uh, infill development in Central Asia. Uh, really, I had a great time learning from you about the urbanization processes in our countries and what our governments can do for, uh, for smooth uh, transition by uh, preserving our past and ensuring development. Uh, definitely, our discussion today would not be possible without the great help and support from our valid partner, the Foreign Policy Center, and especially to Adam. Uh, we very much appreciate our partnership and look forward to having more joint events with you. I sincerely hope uh, you enjoy today, uh, today's discussion. And thank you very much for your participation. And very soon we would have the highlight of this event in uh, uh, our platform uh, at 3wkabar.asia. 
Thank you very much.